never knew what it was. Look, I got fire and desire. I got pain and I got passion. I got lighters and I got man. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. Certainly want to take this time to welcome you to our Live at 5. It's 5 o'clock and it's Wednesday, so you know exactly what time it is. It's time for Live at 5. This is where I'm going to I take a live a question that have been given to me, and I answer those live with you today. So I've got five great questions that have been sent in. Let's get to question number one. Are angels also saved because of the blood of Jesus, and do they repent when they make uh, errors? Okay. Let's talk about their, their salvation, first of all. You know, is, is it for their salvation? No. Angels are not saved because of the by the blood of Jesus. Uh, there's no need for angels to be saved. Jesus didn't die for angels. He died for humans. Christ came for the lost, those who have souls. And, and first of all, angels are not lost souls. Angels do not have souls. Humans are the ones who are ha have a living soul that can be lost, that can die eternally, that can be separated. And so the fact that angels are people is one of the first things that lets us know that the idea of salvation is does not is not for them. I want you to go and read something to you. It says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us. There's no adoption of angels, only of the adoption of the elect. He adopted us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and he gave him great pleasure. So you begin to see, again, this idea of that, that angels are not included in salvation. Hebrews chapter uh, 2, verse 14 through 16. Again, I want to just build a case for you here. It says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all, who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That's not angels. For surely it is not angels. That's what the scripture says. Surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. The, the, the angels did not, they're not Abraham's descendants. They did not descend from Adam and Eve. They are called ministering spirits. It says they're ministering spirits set out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. So again, I wanted to lay the groundwork for you for scripture to let you know. It says they minister to those who are going to inherit salvation. Now, in terms of repenting, angels don't mess up like we do. They just don't, you know, they're not just sit sitting around saying, oops, I, you know, I made a mistake. No, angels are in heaven. They behold the face of God, the Bible says, continually. And on top of that, they are perfect. Now, when, when you understand perfect, you know, there's none perfect but God. No, when, when we deal with perfection here, what it means is that angels are, the angels that are in heaven right now are as they have always been and were always meant to be. They are as they were made and as they are purposed. And, you know, the scripture talks about this, this, this something in Jude in verse five and six. And I'm going to read that to you and because it deals with angels who left their first estate. So for those angels who stayed and, and were obedient to God and stayed in their proper domain, or in other words, they kept their first estate, they remained faithful to God. They, they were made perfect and they stayed in their perfect place in the idea of perfection is the idea of perfect obedience. Let me read this Jude 5 through 6. But I want to remind you that you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their first estate or did not keep their proper place, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the day of judgment of the great day. So when you look at these angels here, uh, you know, the angels that left their first estate, yes, they're, they've changed. They are now demons. But the ones who stayed have stayed in a place of absolute perfection in their obedience to God. There, there is no sin there. They, they don't they, they don't operate, you know, in a will of their own. They, they've decided they've made a decision here. Uh, and, and that's what happened with that, you know, the split that happened in heaven. There was a decision. These angels that are in heaven now have made a decision, a choice long ago. And in them is no desire to go the way of demons who are going to be in hell, uh, separated from God eternally. 
They, you know, they are witnesses to the war between good and evil that's being played out, uh, you know, in the spiritual realm that's being played out. And they know what side they're on. They've made their choice. They remember Lucifer. They remember Lucifer being cast out. They remember him being stripped of his power and his beauty and all the honor that's there. They see their brethren, you know, uh, you know, because angels are in the heavens and they're sent down to the earth. They watch the, the, these demons who just are clinging to any type of life whatsoever, like parasites where, Lord, don't cast us out into the abyss. Uh, throw us into those swine over there. So, you know, so, so any kind of physical life, they're just clinging to them. And they realize that there's an eternal separation that's prepared for these angels. They're in everlasting chains of darkness right now. So this idea that, you know, angels will make mistakes. No, those angels that, that are in heaven right now that serve God, serve God in absolute perfection. There's never a place where those angels will be sent by God and somehow they'll make up in their own mind. They're not going to do what the Lord has called them to do. That God says protect and they won't protect. No. They don't make those they don't make those kind of mistakes. They don't have souls like we do. So therefore, they don't need salvation like we do. But they also because they are not human and we're not a part of the fall. They also don't make errors that require repentance like we do. Let's take a look at question number two. And I hope that helps you with that first question. Great question, too. I heard it ministered that Jesus received the Holy Ghost when he was water baptized. Did he have to become the Messiah? Well, first of all, scripture never says that Jesus received the Holy Ghost after the baptism uh, with John. Uh, you know, we know that the, this ascended upon him and the Bible says, listen, this is my son who I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, the ascending of the spirit upon Jesus was not a baptism, if you will, of the spirit, but it was a sign that he is the son of God. I'm going to read something to you. Once again, this is out of the book of uh, John. And, and this is verse 32. Uh, and it says, then John gave this testimony. Uh, and this is John chapter one. It says, I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. That's Jesus. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. This is God. He says, God told me the man in whom you see the spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear that. Jesus is the one, he says, the one you see the dove coming down as a sign to him, he says, this is the one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then verse 34 says, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. So when you look at this, Jesus is not receiving the Holy Spirit here. The Bible tells us here that he was conceived of God. He was conceived of the Spirit. So this is not, you know, at, uh, you know, his baptism of the Holy Spirit is first time he's receiving the Spirit because he's born of the Spirit. This is a manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a manifestation for John. It's a, it's a sign for John. It's a sign for the world. Christ did not need any additional experiences with the Holy Spirit because the Bible tells us that he's given the Spirit without measure. I'm going to read this to you. It says, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words for God's Spirit is upon him without measure or limit. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah is talking about the Messiah coming, and he talks about this branch of Jesse, the, the stump that, that, that's going to grow uh, and that's going to bear fruit. And then he immediately adds something that's important. He says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, right? This is not like he's going to be born and then, then you know, then the spirit is going to rest on him. He says, no, with all of these prophecies that are going to happen, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to be. And when he comes into being, the spirit of the Lord is going to always be already be there. It's going to rest on him. So the idea that Jesus will become the Messiah. No, he has always been the Messiah. He is the lamb. As scripture says that was slain before the foundation of the world. He's always been the savior. So the coming of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus, you know, his baptism is actually a part of the public consecration. It's a setting apart of him. It is the announcement that he is the one and that Jesus is the one who is going to operate in the office of the Messiah. Listen, again, hopefully that helps. And I thank you for your question. Let's look at question number three. Was the casting out of Satan from heaven before the creation of man or after? If you had asked me this maybe five years ago, I would have said before the creation of man, Satan has come down to earth. And then that's why we see him in the Garden of Eden. Right. But. I want you to look at something here and because my answer today is really diff different that, you know, the best answer I could give you today would be that it has not yet fully happened. 
you know, there's an idea that, you know, Satan is cast down from heaven and, you know, he's in the earthly realm and he does not have any kind of access to heaven whatsoever. But the truth of the matter is the scripture tells us here that Satan does have access to heaven even now, that the fullness of being cast out has not yet happened. I want to read something to you. This is out of the book of Revelation chapter 12. And, and, and you know, this is kind of where we get our real best look at Satan being cast out from heaven. It says, uh, seven. this is seven and eight. It says, a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. This is Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Now, it says, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. I mean, they cannot be there. They can't, they, they, they can't dwell there. They, and that dwelling is not like, well, we can be there for a few minutes. No, this means that there's absolutely a total restriction of the angels, these, these demons, as well as Satan in heaven. Yet, we see here, Satan still has access to heaven, right? When we look at the book of Job. Job, we, we see this, you know, the sons of God come before the Lord and, and, and the Bible says that Satan also. So the angels are coming before God, but Satan is also coming. And there's a conversation that God is having with, 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 with Satan. You know, have you uh, tried my servant Job? You know, so they're, they're conversing back and forth. So when you begin to look at this, Revelation 12, 10, th th again, once again, this Revelation chapter 12, verse number 10. Again, it's where we get our great example. It says, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Wait a minute. So that means that this is future tense because the accuser of the brethren is accusing us even now. Right. The Bible says he accused them before our God. He was before the throne. He had access here up until this future time that's going to happen. So, you know, so when you begin to look at this, we have this idea, you know, there's nothing, you know, God can't have anything evil and wicked in his presence. Yet we see here that that's a misconception about the power of God. That really is very limiting when you when you really understand God and the fact that Satan works for him. That God uses Satan, he uses the demons. There's nothing that's off limits to God. There's nothing that God is like, ah, that's so dirty, I can't touch. It's got so much filth on it that I can't even use it. No, God even uses what the enemy means for evil. God's able to use that very evil and make it work out for our good. So when you look at this, the Bible clearly tells us that, you know, through Job, Satan and his, Satan comes before God and reports and, you know, talk. he says he's going to and fro in the earth. You know, the Lord says, where you been? What you, what you been doing? He said, I mean, you know, I'm going to and fro, seeing who I can, you know, could, you know, confuse and, and trip up. And then we see also here this accuser of the brethren who is right. He's before God whispering and trying to accuse us day and night, which is why we have an advocate, which is why we have a, an intercessor for us. So there's some scripture here I would imagine it would give you a little pause, right? Satan, Jesus says this. He says, and I said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And, you know, when we look at fall, we look at the fall, we look at the final fall, but the Bible actually speaks to us about four different types of fall, falls. And there's a fall that is falling from the place of being glorified and now to the place of being profane. We see this fall spoken of in Ezekiel chapter 28 when we talk, when, you know, we talk about the angel and how this, this, this anointed cherub, who, you know, had these pipes built into his body and how beautiful he was and burled and all the, the stones that were kind of built into him. And it says he was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. There was a, there was this perfection from glorious. Now we have a fall. There was another place that we're really dealing with, which is the final places from having any access to heaven and a complete restriction to the earth, right? That's what, you know, you can no longer have access to heaven, but there's only a restriction to the earth. That's that's going to be found in Revelation chapter 12, verse number nine. But then there's another fall where we see where Satan has his reign here of the earth for a period of time. Then he's placed in bondage into the bottomless pit for a thousand years, right? That's during the millennial reign. We'll find that in, in Revelation chapter 20. You'll find out that that's another fall of Satan that's being dealt with. And finally, the very end, the final fall that, that we really look at, that is the complete casting out of Satan from the earth, new earth, heaven, 
every realm possible. No more existence from him in connection to us is going to be from the pit where he goes from this pit to the lake of fire where that will, will, will know him and see him and hear of him no more. That's also in Revelation chapter 20. So when you begin to look at these various falls, when Jesus talks about, I saw Satan fall like heaven, like, like lightning from heaven. Jesus is not saying, you know, he came down and he shot down from heaven to the earth. No, he's now looking and saying his fall was so dramatic. It was literally like a lightning bolt coming down from heaven. That, that's what he's actually saying. He's not saying Satan has fallen, come down to earth, and now he's resting in the earth, but he can no longer accuse the brethren. He no longer has access unto the heavenly realm. No, absolutely not. That's going to come in the future where there'll be no more Satan. So the truth of the matter is Satan is, is can, called the prince of the air for a reason. He's here. He's here in the earth, but yet he's still the accuser of the brethren. He's not just accusing and screaming, you know, from a distance. Satan still has access to the throne to accuse us. But we, as, a, as believers, have an advocate. We have an advocate who is there literally making intercessory, uh, intercessory for us and intercessory prayer. And he's interceding for us with his words and with his life for us every single day. So hopefully when you begin to look at, well, you know, was it before or after, truth be told, the fall that you're talking about, no, that, 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 that final, that, that fall where Satan is only restricted to the earth has yet to happen. He still has access to the heavenly realm. So hopefully that again, more over that, look at, remember those scriptures that I gave you, but I want you to really look at the way this is spoken, because in Revelation chapter 20, let me, let me give you this again, 10 through 11. Here's what it says. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now salvation has come. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses us day and night has been hurled, hurled down. Check this out. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So when you look at this, this, this now is a salvation coming. Now the accuser of the brethren has been hurled down. He no longer can accuse us. Well, he's still accusing us now. He, he, he has not stopped accusing us. So this is future tense and it foretells of Satan's final fall from heaven. Let's look at uh, question number four. It says, Jesus was a man who lived under the law of Moses all of his life. Why do Christians believe that we are to follow Jesus' teaching instead of the Holy Spirit of the true New Testament? I get it. New Testament kind of starts in the book of Acts, right? You know, when you, so the Bible says that, you know, when the Holy Ghost comes, you shall receive power and you'll be witnesses of me, right? You'll be witnesses about my life. You'll be witnesses for me, right? You, you will work for me in, in Judea and Samaria and in Jerusalem and to the uttermost parts of the world. So yeah, do we obey the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Do we throw the teachings of Jesus out uh, as if they're part of some other, you know, o the Old Testament, you know, not worthy of being walked into the new covenant? Absolutely not. We can't do that because when the Holy Spirit comes, which is what the Bible talks about, guess who the Holy Spirit is going to talk about? He's only going to talk about Jesus. What is he, what's he going to confirm? He's going to confirm the words that Jesus actually spoke. John 16, 13 through 14 says this, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. That sounds like Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life, right? No man comes to the father, but by me, by the Holy Spirit. No, no, but by me, right? So he says, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Where do you think he's going to get his words from? What do you think he's going to be talking about? Who do you think he's going to be confirming? He's only going to be confirming the words of the Lord. Jesus said, listen, I want you to understand something. We're not down in the Old Testament. He says, I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. He says, I came to accomplish their purpose. I came to fulfill their purpose. Their purpose was to actually expose the need for Christ, expose the need for Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit is now coming to constantly confirm and to bring back to our remembrance whatever things he has said. Here's what Jesus said. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. That's that's Christianity. He said, that's what Jesus actually said. He, and he said, the spirit 
is going to bring back to your remembrance whatever things I have said, whatsoever things I have spoken, not of his own, not some newfangled revelation. He's only going to bring back to your remembrance whatever I have already spoken, my words. The Lord says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? You can't be a Christian without obeying Christ and the words of Christ. So when you look at this, there's no way that, you know, we can, you know, the Holy Spirit is awesome. And the Holy Spirit is, he, he has been des designing this moment to step in before the very foundation of the world. Yet, he's in complete concert with the Son of God in that the Old Testament, the Father spoke about the Son. The Son comes into the earth, glorifying the Father by his obedience to the Father. And then the Holy Spirit comes, who is the third part of the triune Godhead, who now comes and confirms for generations who will never be able to touch Christ. He now confirms that Christ lived, that Christ died, and that Christ is resurrected, and that this salvation that is offered is offered even now. Even though he's not bodily here, the Holy Spirit has come back and to remind us of the promises of God. So we, 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 there's absolutely no way that we can throw out the teachings of Christ and still be Christians. That's absolutely impossible. Listen, I hopefully that helps you there. Let's look at question number five. This is our fifth and our final question. Since Christianity teaches forgiveness, why doesn't Jesus forgive those who won't believe in him? Well, guess what? Here's the good news. He actually already has. Jesus' forgiveness is one way. It has, I mean, it doesn't require, it does, has no conditions placed on it whatsoever. It is one way. Now, there's conditions that you may have to receive it, but there's no conditions on his forgiveness. Jesus said, listen, I forgive, I forgive you. M remember, on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Nobody asked him for that. No, nobody solicited the forgiveness. He simply said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So when you begin to look at this, forgiveness is now available for everybody because of the shed blood of Christ. So what, what has Christ done in his forgiveness? He's answered your question. He has forgiven those people who simply will not uh, come to him. He's forgiven people who don't want to have a relationship with him. He's made forgiveness is now possible for anybody who wants it. Now, that's the key, though. Because of the nature of God, he's still not going to force even forgiveness on us. He won't make us receive his forgiveness. So in order to receive forgiveness, it's only logical, right? The, the person who's going to receive forgiveness has to acknowledge that something needed to be forgiven or the forgiveness is nullified. It's nothing, right? If there's nothing that needs to be forgiven, then Christ's forgiveness is useless, right? So if you confess it, that, that, now the only thing you got to do is be able to say, yeah, that I, man, I need that forgiveness. I want that forgiveness. I want to receive that forgiveness. The Lord said, listen, if you confess that you need the forgiveness, which means that you know something is wrong, you're absolutely forgiven. There's no questions asked. You have the forgiveness that you seek. So the question that you're asking, has Jesus forgiven us? Yeah. Does he forgive us for our lack of faith? Yes. Does he forgive us for our, our sins? All of those deeper issues? Absolutely not. Absolutely right. But you know what Jesus' forgiveness does? He, His forgiveness by itself makes a relationship with God possible. But it does not force the relationship. Those who will not be forgiven, those who will not walk in the forgiveness of Christ will only not walk in it simply because they've turned their back on accepting the relationship that this forgiveness offers. Come to me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. There are people who can have a free offer, but guess what? You don't have to take it. You know, there are people who can be hungry today. You know, the people outside of Cracker Barrel, and they've always got, they got this cheese and they've got all these things. That pe they're people who look and they're, they're hungry and they're trying to figure out what they're going to eat. And there's something free right there. But it doesn't force you for whatever reason. How many people do you think walk by there and never taste the cheese, never taste the crackers, even though they're free? And guess what? We, at the end of the day, when the ship is over, the guy turns around and he takes those cheese, takes that cheese and crackers back, uneaten, unreceived, even though it was offered all day. Whatever was not eaten, he brings back and takes back. It was free, but we didn't receive it. So understand this. Jesus has offered this free this is a free gift. My forgiveness is here. I forgive you of your sins. I'm faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Just get under the shower. you got to admit that you're dirty in order to receive it. And that's where the fault is. So Jesus has offered him his, friend, his hand in friendship. Those who will not be friends of God will simply be the ones who have smacked it away. 
Listen, I hope that that helps you with that question. Which we're here to do. We're here to be a blessing. We're here to educate. Because I always say that I believe that the most important, most powerful believer, especially in this day, is going to be an educated believer. I'm so glad that you were here today with us with this Live at Five. Don't forget to share this with your friends. I think that these are going to be, these questions are really great. I can, I am just so in awe of the way that you're thinking and the things that you're thinking and the things that you want to know. And I'm just appreciative that you are bringing those to me so that I can be a part of your growth. So listen, let's continue this. We'll, let's continue tomorrow because we'll be here tomorrow, 730 for Bible study. We'll be breaking down the word of God, text line by line, precept by precept. So we've got some things that we've been studying. Uh, keep asking me. Uh, I've got been getting some personal questions about various areas in the Bible. So I really appreciate that. And I'm always glad and honored to be a part of your growth. So listen, let's continue to keep growing together and continue and continue to break open the word of God, to see the great gift that God has offered us through his word. God bless you. Have an awesome Wednesday.